The following message was recorded live at Hope City House of Prayer in Columbus, Ohio. For more information, visit hopecity614.org. We appreciate your prayers and your financial support, which enable us to continue to fulfill the Great Commission. Amen. Come on, y'all can worship the Lord. That is a beautiful, beautiful sound. That's the cry of redeemed people. That's the worship that comes out of people who've been set free. No doubts. No questions. Perfect liberty. Perfect liberty. Lord, we love you. (laughs) Father, we love you. We thank you for setting us free. Lord, I thank you for the people in this room that you've put a song in their heart and you've given them the unction to ascribe worth to you, to praise you. So, Lord, we thank you. (laughs) And, Lord, as your word, Lord, as your word goes forth today, Lord, I pray that our hearts would continue to be set on you. Lord, that, Jesus, you would be the focal point of everything that's spoken in this room today. And give us supernatural power, Lord, to focus on you and to hear what what you want to say to us and what you want to say right now. And so, Lord, we just invite the spirit of wisdom and revelation in this room make listening easy, make speaking easy, and let us encounter your love as your word goes forth. (laughs) For those of you who weren't able to sing and scream hallelujah from a true heart, it is my deep and earnest plea that by the time I'm done here in these few short minutes that you will, because we're going to try this again after I finish with this message, because I look around and I can tell there's some folks still in bondage weighed down perhaps by the cares of this life and as we always sing here your praise is evidence of your deliverance and so no matter what you've gone through no matter what you had to endure nothing should silence you nothing should restrict you from opening your mouth and giving god the praise because it ain't brian it ain't jared and no one in this room to set you free so it's not unto man but it's unto the lord and he's worthy to be praised rather we experience that personal satisfaction from it or not just for the fact that he's God and so we're going to sing that again when we conclude here just in a few minutes and I'm praying that we can get 100% participation as the Holy Spirit moves on you and opens the eyes of your heart to see that he loves you that he cares for you and that it's true there's nothing but the blood it's not just a cute phrase but it's it's something more powerful than anyone in this room has understanding to comprehend And so, Lord, we thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated, all you wonderful people who are still standing. How's everybody doing today? I'm excited and uh, ready to just look at a few things. I was very intentional with letting worship go just a little bit longer than we typically do um, for the simple fact that what I'm going to be talking about this morning is about praise. And so rather than preach about it or talk about it, why don't we do it? (laughs) And um, that's what the Lord has been putting on my heart for the past week or so. Last Sunday, I talked about the spirit of prophecy and the calling of the sons of God to prophesy in this last hour of human history prior to the return of Christ. And as I studied and prepared for that message, my heart burned within me. But when I was editing the podcast, which I put online, and I listened to some of the things that I said, my heart burned even more with the reality that there's an urgent need for prophets. Amen? If you were here last week, hopefully those dots connect. But even, well, I shouldn't say even more, but as urgent as the need for prophets, there's a need for praisers. See, you get prophesied without having a heart of worship and praise. And you know what? That makes you critical and mean-spirited. But when you combine prophets, that unction and zeal that come from the Word of God, with the heart that overflows with joy inexpressible in the place of praise and adoration of Jesus, then you don't only bring the word of judgment, but you bring hope. And what we need are prophets with that twofold, that double-edged sword in their hand. It's not just decreeing judgment or praying for the ending of abortion or the different issues we pray for. It's prophetic voices that are double-sided coins. On the other side, they're radical worshipers. That's what this generation is groaning for. 
people who will stand true, but people whose hearts worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. And again, this message is going to be a little bit shorter. Actually, let me just say maybe not. I try to always preface it that I won't be up here long, but then I'm really long-winded for those of you who know. But I think that honestly what uh, the Lord has put on my heart to share will not take much time at all. So I'm looking around. I don't know if I see a visitor. Is this your first time here, sir? First time. What's your name? Tony. Nice to meet We got two Tonys, Tony and Tony. It's nice to meet you. Have you here at Hope City. Any other people who have never been here before? Okay, yeah, I think everyone else is here been here before, but thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Honored to have you here with us. Amen. So the fancy title for today's message is praise the purpose of our purchase. Alliteration is like my favorite thing to do these days, but praise the purpose of our purchase. And how many of y'all know we've been purchased We've been purchased, not with the blood of bulls and goats, not with gold and silver, but with the precious blood of the Lamb of God. We've been purchased. We've been bought back, and we've been brought back. And so the purpose of the purchased is to praise. And so that's the subject today, praise the purpose of our purchase. If you would, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. And if we could stand for the reading of God's holy word. I'm excited about this topic because I've found that praise is the entry point into the presence of God. It says, come before him with thanksgiving, come before him with praise, with shouts of joy. And so if you've been feeling a lack of his presence, you must not be praising much. Praise is the entry point into his presence. But in Ephesians chapter 1, I want to read verses number 3 through 14. And just as a side note, this first chapter here is loaded with insight and revelation. So we're not going to be able to unpack all of this, of course. But I would encourage you to really study this first chapter, especially of Ephesians. But beginning in verse number three, reading from the New King James, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Lord, Let those words sink deep into our brain, into our heart, into the fiber of our being, that we would know this gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe see it. I want to direct our attention here to verse number six. In the New King James, it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, and some other translations, I believe, capture or make it more easy for us to comprehend his point here, it reads, to the praise of his, for the praise of his glorious grace. And so the beginning question here is, what is our purpose? <laughs> and it's answered here. We were praised, or we were redeemed, rather, unto the praise of God's grace. 
We were redeemed unto the praise of his grace. The question of what is our existence about is answered in this, in this passage of scripture. Why are we here? Why have we been redeemed? Why do you have an inheritance? Why is your heart beating right now? Why did God choose to send you to the earth in 2012? It's because of one purpose, one primary purpose, I should say. And that is he might be praised for his glorious grace. These hands, your mouth, your eyes, your nose, every part of your human body was constructed, designed by God to worship him. You know, your eyes weren't meant to simply look at things you want to look at. God's intention in designing your eyes is that when you look at creation and behold the wonders and the splendor of the mountains and the majestic sea and all the different colors of the flowers in the field, that you would look again to him and ascribe praise to him. When you look at ladybugs with little dots and little red paint on their wings, it wasn't just to make you think, well, that's cool, but it was to direct your eyes and your heart to the creator not the creation, your hands, your feet, every part of your being was created to direct you back to the source. Tragically, as you know, in the book of Romans, what happened is they no longer served the creator, but the creation. They begin to look at the work of their own hands. They begin to even worship animals. And there's people today that still worship animals. In America, that's unintelligible. And we think of that as something that's absurd because we're so sophisticated now in our technological world. But in the modern day context, we worship other things that have been constructed by man's hands. We worship technology. We worship philosophy. We worship all these different things, but we've lost our focus because we forgot our purpose. And our purpose is primarily, as I said, to praise him. That's what we come in here and we sing for those of you who got here on time. As we're singing these different songs, sometimes I know in the carnal mind, you're like, why do you keep singing that over and over and over again? You might get along with it for the first two or three minutes. and like, okay, bro, you done sang that about 60 times. Can we go into the next phrase? Be honest. Who's ever had a thought like that? Don't be bashful. I mean, come on. I know I'm not in a room full of perfect people, am I? Maybe I am just the only one that's that self-centered at times. But my point is that our our mindset, even as we enter into worship and prayer and to praising God, a lot of times is centered on us. What do I get out of it? How much do I enjoy the song? How much do I feel this beat? How much do I like what I hear? And that is the dilemma. That's an epidemic of idolatry that is plaguing the church in this generation because we have forgotten that it's not about us, but it is about him. And so oftentimes it takes these reminders which seem to click the moment you hear them, but then you have to look at your life and see, do you really line up with all the things you nod your head to and say amen to? Do you really look to Jesus when you look out and you see that sunset and you see the sun rise or you see the birds or you see even the, the creations that man has invented through the intellect given by God? Do you instantly turn back to Jesus and say, wow, what a wonderful God. That's the essence of childlike faith, captivation, fascination, the wonder, the innocence, believing all things are possible. And when you begin to become uh, analytical and you start to be, you know, one of those people that try to figure everything out and you lose the simplicity of your own faith, you'll never see beauty. You'll never see the other side or the silver lining in the cloud. You're always focused on the negative. And so in the same way that worship and prayer is something that we should do always, praise is something that we should do always too. And praise is not defined by jumping and waving your hands necessarily. Praise in practice is a constant attention to Jesus. That in all things he might be glorified. That even in the situations of life that seem tough and difficult to handle, that you say, Jesus, you're so worthy because I know that you're going to turn this around for for my good so that I can worship you more. That's the beautiful cycle of praise. That wonder in the person of Christ. When he's revealed. How if you've encountered Jesus. It causes your heart to explode. Does anybody relate to what I'm saying today? And so that's where I've been at in the past week. 
Last Sunday, I shared a testimony about how even in the place of prayer, uh, I had become mechanical. I know so many Bible verses because I read Bible a lot. I've heard a lot of messages about why we should pray, and I know the urgency of the hour. And so if you're not careful, you get into this rut of going through the motions with a sincere heart. And I noticed a detachment from the heart of God in my own life last, back about a week and a half ago. And I said, God, where am I missing the point? Is it sin? Is it some unconfessed thing I don't know about? I mean, show me my heart. And he showed me that I was seeking him for myself, for my glory, wanting to be vindicated by my emotional experience or be vindicated by my consistent record of prayer or other works of religion. But my focus in prayer was not that I would know him, not that my heart would connect, but that I would be able to check off on the list. I prayed for two hours a day. And so we have to be careful, even in the place of praise, that when we come before him, we realize that it's all about him. So I think I've made that point pretty clear. And I think that we're all on the same page there with that. Now, oftentimes when we um, think of praise, if you've grown up in any of the type of churches that I was exposed to as a child, we see praise as a means to an our end. Praise him in the storm. Ever heard that one before? Come on. So we see praise as a means to get what we need or to get what we want. But again, to culminate this point that praise is the purpose of our existence, when you look in heaven and you see the new Jerusalem descending like a city, do you see angels in the Bible looking at God motionless? No. The seraphim burn. And all they say is holy, holy, holy with two hands that are two wings they fly, two wings they cover their face, two wings they cover their feet. And because of a constant setting forth of God in front of them, they can't help but to praise. And so the culmination of human history looks like angels, men, and all creation. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's what the culmination of heaven, and that's when the kingdom comes. That's what's going to fill the earth. When the scripture says that as the waters cover the sea, that the knowledge of your glory will cover the earth. It's not talking about bookshelves all over the world with books about God's glory. He's talking about everything in creation, screaming the glories of God. He's talking about even dolphins and lions and giraffes and ladybugs and saber-toothed tigers, which are now extinct. But everything that's ever been created, even the trees will sway in praise to God. I want to read an interesting passage of scripture to you, which... From the first time that I've read it, it just baffled me because my human, my analytical mind instantly said, that's impossible. But then the Lord said, oh, Brian, with God, all things are possible. So I want you to flip over to Revelation chapter five. And I want to read to you the reaction in heaven when the lamb is found worthy to take the scroll. When the lamb is found worthy to release judgments and to bring it into Satan's kingdom, this is the reaction of the redeemed on the earth, the heavenly creatures, and in fact, every creature. In Revelation 5, I'm going to start in verse 8. He says, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now we need to stop there and just reiterate this point that I constantly bring up that your prayers are being stored up in a bowl. God does not dismiss any of your little prayers. Well, we think are little, but all the prayers of every saint before to come and in this present moment is being collected in a bowl. Do you understand how awesome that is? So excuse me, I'm kind of thinking out loud here, but that baffles my mind. It's not even a point I want to make, but in verse nine, it says, and they sang a new song saying, you're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us a kingdom of priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands screaming 
with a loud voice. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And here's the kicker in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and as such are in the sea and all that are in them. I heard them saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Dolphins, piranhas, cheetahs, somehow, some way in their own language, perhaps can join this song. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne. Could you imagine Fido singing that song? Could you imagine the goldfish? There's nothing that is outside of this reach. Everything that's ever been created, the life-giving spirit has brought to life is praising and worshiping God at the conclusion of it all. When Ephesians says it's his will to gather all things in heaven and in earth together, that's what it looks like at the end of the day. One choir, one voice worshiping the one Lord in the power of the one name given under heaven whereby men can be saved. And it's just something that we should take notice of, that it is, again, something much bigger than our lifespan. But even the songs, think about this. Most of the songs we sing today, you know, they're actually rewrites of songs that have been written hundreds of years ago. I picked up an old hymn, though, at a thrift store once, and I was reading through some of these songs written in the 1700s by Charles Wesley. And I was like, wow, they play that on 104.9. <laughs> I thought Chris Tomlin wrote that. Wait, Jesus calls here. Wait, I thought, I thought that that was Kim, Kim Walker's song. But even throughout history, the Holy Spirit has been moving on all the people of God, leading us up to this finality, this one day when we can sing with one voice. Doesn't that excite you? I mean, seriously, and that's, think about this. This is why Satan wants you not to worship God. That's why if you come to church and you just chill as if you're doing God a favor, you're actually defeating the purpose of your redemption. You might as well leave. If you're going to come and just chill, then just go home. Because the whole purpose of God sending his son to the earth in the likeness of human flesh, <laughs> dying a sinner's death on our behalf to redeem us, was so that we could sing songs to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's why you're saved. Not so you don't go to hell, but so that Jesus gets more glory. And I think if we could just realign ourselves with our purpose of our, of our, our purpose of our purchase, then we would understand why the calamity of sin is wreaking havoc in the earth. It's not because God doesn't have power. It's because the church is ignorant of its purpose. And so we don't fight the war. We sit back and point the finger at all the people who we think are guilty of sinning and all the problems in the world, but we never understand our purpose. Do you know that demons and powers and principalities are actually silenced when the church begins to sing? Satan, Lucifer, was the anointed guardian chair. He was the one that ushered in the praises in heaven. When he lost his domain, Jesus said, I, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He crashed to the earth because of pride. He said, I'll be like the most high. Instantly fell like lightning. <laughs> Instantly, if you get prideful, you will fall like lightning. Lesson of the story. <laughs> but since that time, he doesn't loot, lost his gift or his created purpose. It's just now perverted. And so what he does is he leads people on the earth into worship, but for his glory. And for his praise, because that was a remember, that was the purpose of him falling in the first place. And so what he's done, obviously, you see it in the record industry with hip hop, R&B and jazz and country and all the different genres of music. But even in the church, see, the devil doesn't necessarily come in here singing Drake or singing the latest song on the radio. What he does is put songs in the church that are self-centered and not God-centered. So if you can do a bunch of fancy runs with your voice or you can play awesome keyboard music or guitar music or you're just an incredible 
songwriter, if the purpose of your singing and your preaching and your praying and your playing is not for the glory of Jesus, you actually bought into the devil's trap. And you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping a God that you've made in your own image. He sings like you. And that's why I think about this. Theology that you see in the earth right now, it reflects the musicology or the singing in the earth right now. The doctrine that's taught from pulpits influences the songs that are written. Do you see what I mean? If you read some of those old songs that was written back in the days of revival, interesting, that was the time when nothing but the blood, what can wash away my sin, all those great, amazing grace, all those songs that focus on the power of Jesus, all those songs that focus on the person of Jesus, all those songs that focus on the glorification of Jesus were written in times of revival. And so that's what the Lord is doing today. If he could get our hearts captured once again with his person and with our purpose to praise him, you'll see an instantaneous change of singing or change of the songs that are written today. That's why when we come here, we don't come with a script. We don't say, well, this one will really get the crowd moving. This one will make them mellow down. This one will make them get more money in the offering. (laughs) You know that a lot of preachers actually construct the service to get more money in the offering because they teach. There's a doctrine. This is the behind the scenes stuff that I heard sometimes from different preachers. They know, they said, I heard this from a preacher. He said, people don't give based on their devotion. They give based on their emotion. So they craftily construct the service to sing emotionally driven, charts, personal, self-invested songs so that you feel like, okay, if I give this $100 instantly, I'm about to be a millionaire. (laughs) And it's the trickery of men, but they use music and they use false worship and praise as their ploy to deceive you. And so as we enter into this season of the great awakening that we've been praying for, and we begin to see this harvest of souls come in off the street, we see people in the church come back to their first love. The number one sign will be that praise is focused on Jesus. The song lyrics will change. You can mark that down. I want to talk now just briefly about the power to praise God being a present reality. And if it's our purpose, in, if it's God's purpose, rather, in our redemption, then to not praise God, you're actually working with the spirit of the Antichrist. So when you come into God's presence with this nonchalant, cavalier attitude, you're actually siding up with Satan. And you're resisting and quenching the spirit of God in the room where other people need a breakthrough. So you might have had a bad day. You might not feel too good. Your body might be tired and weak. And so you come into God's presence, lean back. But maybe that person in the chair next to you is in bondage to sexual immorality. So we're working against the Holy Spirit when we don't praise God. Now, we're all human, so I don't want to present this lifestyle that would make it seem that you're always just ready to just jump and scream for joy. Cause honestly, sometimes your body is weak and tired. You might not have, maybe you work third shift and just to come to church was a big deal. So it's not about the external motion, but it's the internal flame. Can you sit there even if physically tired and yearn for Jesus? Can you intercede for, on the behalf of those that are in the room? That's what a heart of praise looks like. Now, as you know, in a scripture, if you would go to second Corinthians chapter five, It's a popular passage of scripture. I've read this and as an evangelist, you know, I commit this one to memory because this is the crux of the gospel. This is the hope of redemption. So you need to know this if you feel called to evangelism. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, or 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse number 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And that is, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then... 
We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, again, evangelistically speaking, you've heard that preached many times. But the point I want to focus on here in verse 17, when he says, behold, all things have become new. What is that new? What does it mean when it's scripture says all things have become new? Is it a list of the things you, is it a list of the things that you don't do anymore? That's a partial truth. I don't go there. I don't say that. I don't watch this. I don't associate there. So that's the first part of the transition of the old to new man. But the second part, I believe, is where a lot of Christians end up becoming stagnant and lukewarm is that they think holiness is abstaining from bad deeds. They never understand what they've been set apart unto. And what we've been set apart unto is for the purpose of making known the glorious grace of God in the place of praise and worship. Singing, rejoicing, proclaiming, silently meditating on the goodness of God. And so a lot of times when people become this new creature, they're kind of stuck because we're justified freely by his grace, declared righteous before the judge. But this work of sanctification is where a lot of people miss it. They think sanctification is on some like time, um, time lapse type of thing. We're like, well, maybe six months from now, I'll be delivered from pornography. Maybe eight months from now, I'll be delivered from smoking weed. And so they put this sin management program together. But instantaneously, you know, you can be delivered. It's possible. I just want to assure you, if you're struggling with sin today, don't put God on your timetable and say, well, maybe by next year I'll get over it. There's power in the blood of Jesus to deliver you instantly. But this new, this new man, we're in a tug of war. Spiritually speaking, you've got your spirit that's been regenerated by the power of God. And you long for holiness. You long to do God's will. You delight in him. Singing is a delight. You love it. You would worship all day if your body wasn't tired because your inner man is alive. But on the other hand, you do have this war that's raging in your members that says, go to sleep. Don't get up. You need to eat. Don't fast. Uh, I don't feel like it. And so there's that guy talking to you and there's the Holy Spirit leading you in the, the ways of holiness. I always think of it kind of like the cartoon, you know, where you've got like the little devil on one shoulder. <laughs> you got the angel on the other shoulder. One's, you know, telling you good and the other's telling you do bad. I mean, that's kind of a good, clear picture of what happens before you or as you enter into praise and worship. If you've ever found yourself apathetic toward God in the place of praise and worship or prayer even, I assure you that that is not the Holy Spirit. It's your old man. The spirit-born, spirit-led, spirit-filled person longs to worship God. They're the folks that oftentimes you have to tell to chill out a little bit because they're just out of control. (laughs) It's an uncontainable unction to just sing. But then when you got those people that, you know, they cross their arms and they just stare at people and they critically accuse people in their mind, you're listening to the old man, the flesh. And the devil accentuates the desires of the flesh to keep you out of your purpose. So as long as you never become a worshiper and a praiser, you'll never fulfill the will of God. All you will be is a calloused heart sinner who has enough religious mumbo jumbo in their brain to keep them convinced they're right with God. And so the devil fights the church on a, in the place of worship because this is what will happen. If the city of Columbus gets filled with light of the gospel, the light of God's countenance, if we get filled with understanding of our purpose, the powers that be, the demonic strongholds and principalities that create havoc and that produce all the manifestation of all the sin and crime, do you know that that power will be broken? It will be broken in worship. This end time move of the Holy Spirit And as it was in any time and any time when the Lord woke up a generation, it was always because there was prophetic voices that proclaimed the gospel unapologetically. And there was people who worship God in spirit and in truth. And so that's where this city and every city probably in the earth is kind of hanging in the balance because we're quicker to jump on the bandwagon. And yeah, we want to preach the truth. We want to preach the gospel. We want to preach, you know, against sin. But how much time do you spend in his presence? 
How much time do you spend with Jesus just meditating on his goodness? And that's really where the war is at right now. You've got the other side of that coin where people, they always do is spend time in his presence. Just want to have journal time and, and, you know, coffee time and just think about Jesus. But the two go hand in hand. If you spend time in his presence, you will instantly be transitioned to the place of preaching. Not necessarily with words, but in some kind of way, you'll proclaim the glory of God. And if you're truly proclaiming the glory of God with power, it will be because you spent time in the secret place. And so that's what this city needs. It needs people not with just zeal, not just with humanistic power or unction, but the Holy Spirit driven, induced passion that comes from praising God. Has anybody ever just been weak and something inside of you rose up and you just said, bless your name. And it gave you just enough strength to keep going. Or you found yourself having a little difficulty stirring yourself in prayer. You didn't feel like praying for revival. You could care less about the ending of abortion, and you're kind of just like, Lord, help me. I'm pitiful. I'm wretched. Oh, Lord. But then you just, your Holy Spirit sense kicked in, and you said, but I thank you for your blood poured out on Calvary. And then that began to rise up in you, this unction and desire. That's why I said praise is the entry point into his presence. Because when I don't know what to say, and I have nothing to kick me and keep me going, I just begin to thank God for who he is. Thank God for what he's done. Thank God for how he's blessed me with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Thank God for how he's chosen me and called me by his own name. And I just begin to see how good he's been to me. And that instantly pushes me into the place of intercession, that place of worship. And so this is where people miss it. They look at people like us or they say, man, your personality type is just given to the extroverted type of worship and praise. So they chalk up passion to a personality type. That's not how it works. Passion comes from praising. You get what I mean by that? Just start with a little bit of praise. Open your mouth just a little bit wider next time. Just lift your hand a little bit higher. Just do something that makes you physically uncomfortable and watch the Holy Spirit. Meet that act of faith and give you power to keep going. That's what this city needs. People who will just trust God and take him at his word. That's what creation's groaning for, the sons of God. And that's what separates the sons of God from the slaves. Slaves have no reason to worship because they're still in bondage. But if you've been delivered and set free, then you can praise the Lord. Then you can worship him in spirit and in truth because there's nothing hindering your heart. You're no longer in bondage. You know what sin does? It's like putting a 10-ton brick on your head and saying, stand up on this chair. It's not possible. So when your heart is in shackles, You're not able to lift your hand. It's like a filthy spider web that keeps you like this. But when you've been set free, truly, it's it's a natural, supernatural reaction. Hands fly up. Song we sing, your praise is evidence of your deliverance. And that's what we need to see. Now, let's see here. Not only is praise our purpose, but praise is, evangelistically speaking, the power to win souls. Because I tell you, nothing's more unattractive than a bored Christian. (laughs) Nothing makes a sinner who already finds pleasure in this filthy world more turned off from your Jesus when you mope around and talk about him as if he's just some artifact in a museum. So we need to be praisers for the fact of evangelism. So in Psalm 40, I want to look at a couple Psalms. Some people wonder why they're having no impact on their family and friends, why they have no impact in their workplace or in the school. And you think that just by hanging out with somebody, you're just going to rub off your Christian belief on them. (laughs) It's not a disease that you catch. It's not like, you know, well, I'll just hang out with them and maybe they'll see my light. It doesn't work like that. What draws sinners to repentance is when they see a reason in you. In Psalm 40, in verse number three, it says, he put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. When the Lord puts that new song of praise into your mouth, many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. If you flip over to Psalm 51, the tragedy is that many Christians have lost this joy, and they no longer have that ability to 
praise God with this song. So I want to read here Psalm 51. I'm going to read actually a good portion of it in verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercy. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you've broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then... I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Acknowledgement of your spiritual depravity and utter need for God and the restoration of joy. That new song that comes from a person that really has a testimony. Then you'll be able to teach transgressors his way. Then sinners will be converted to God. That's why the scripture and popular one we always talk about, Revelation twelve eleven, says they overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb, word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives, even unto the death. So the devil wants to fight you from fighting against him. It's a preemptive attack. Shame, because David, you know why he wrote Psalm 51? That's his prayer after he committed that popular sin with Bathsheba after he disgraced the name of the Lord, after he did this deplorable thing for the righteous king to do. That's how he responded to God, that mercy cry. And his purpose was not that I would be right, but that sinners would be converted. So that's what I want to just kind of close here with today. Some of you, maybe you lost the joy of your salvation. You don't really feel it in your spirit. You think the words are great. The lyrics... Yeah, I agree with those lyrics. But nothing inside of me moves when I think about the blood of Jesus. I treat it as commonplace. I'm no longer stirred in my holy my spirit by the Holy Spirit. Because I I take your grace, Lord, and I thank you for saving me, but let me go ahead and just continue to live an apathetic life. That's the human reaction. But the Spirit of God wants to restore the joy of your salvation so that you can be filled with a new song. And so that God's name would be glorified as more sinners are converted and turned back to him and find their purpose in a place of prayer. The last scripture I want to read to you is from Hebrews chapter 13. I've been making a commitment to not just ramble off scriptures from my memory, but to just really show people in the Bible what's written there because I think Sometimes people just need to see it for themselves. Even if you trust what I'm saying is in there, something happens in my spirit when I read it. I don't know how that works necessarily, but I thank God for the written word. Hebrews 13, starting verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. (laughs) Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, 
giving thanks to his name. But we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Sometimes praise is a sacrifice. But it's so worth it. It's worth it. I promise you this. If you push past your flesh and you begin to praise God in those moments of weakness, those moments of confusion, and you just simply stand on the word that the Lord has redeemed us unto praise. When you die, when your candle is extinguished and you have no more flame of life, it will be worth it. When the book is open, because there is a book and it will be open, when that book is opened and you see Saturday, March, what was yesterday, 24th, whatever the date was, I felt groggy and weak at 11.30 a.m., I was at fire in the night, screaming for revival, but yet today the devil's bombarding me with doubt, and I don't even believe that the Bible is real. Anybody ever been in a place like that? Because the devil is at work. He counterattacks. And I don't feel like reading my Bible today. I'll just chill and watch March Madness all day. But I tell you, if you choose in those moments of confusion and against the deep, devilish attacks of the demons that are all over this place. You know there's demons everywhere and they're shooting fiery darts at you. (laughs) If you would choose to worship and praise God and to seek his face in those moments when the books are open, you'll be qualified to hear the phrase, I hope that you all long to hear that I live for. Well done. Well done. Well done. My good and my faithful servant. You had every reason, according to human logic, to deny me. You prayed for breakthrough and you didn't get it. You fasted and you felt weaker than you did before you began to fast. You've been praying for that loved one to be saved and they're worse than ever. You prayed for that person to get healed and they died of cancer. But yet you believe me and you continue to praise me. Well done. And so that's what I I believe that Lord wants to restore our understanding of our redemption And restore our focus. That no matter what comes. As Paul wrote to the Romans. Nothing. Death nor life. No angel nor demon. No power. No principality. Nothing is able to separate us from the love of God. Which is in Christ Jesus. And to the degree that we praise him. Will we be aware of that great magnificent love. Because I tell you. As the scripture said. We have no city here. Columbus being revived is not the goal of God. The new Jerusalem coming is. Columbus, as we know it, may no longer even exist one day. Because the Lord will come and he will redraw boundary lines. He'll reappoint leaders. He'll rename cities. He's going to make all things new. Whether he keeps the name Columbus or not, I don't know. But this city being awakened is not the goal of God. It's his city coming. So our desire as a church... Is not just to see an awakening in the city, although we should pray in the meantime. But our great goal, the driving force of our life, is that we see that city coming down in the king of glory with 10,000 of his saints right on a white horse, followed by his army, arrayed in white linen. That is the hope. That will elicit praise. When you get an accurate view of the gospel, You get an accurate view of the purchased possession that you are and why you breathe. I told a fib. I want to read one more scripture. In Acts 17, I probably should have read this earlier, but I want to make sure I read this. Because this, well, I believe, kind of stabilized that what I'm saying is not just a present reality, but this is a story throughout scripture. And this is a story that has eternal significance and it has applied to every generation. And I want to look at Paul in the city of Athens, because I believe that the Western world today 
is a correlation to that city because that was a center of knowledge. That was a place where all the smarty pants went to hang out and talk. And in the midst of this philosophical human wisdom, antichrist culture, this is how Apostle Paul brings the gospel. Verse 16 When Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Now, let me just ask you, who's provoked in your spirit when you see this city given over, this nation given over to idols? That's what true worshipers, that's what praisers instantly recognize. The praise that's due to him is going to Brutus the Buckeye, and that grieves the Holy Spirit within me. The praise that's due to him is going to the preacher, and that grieves the Holy Spirit within me. The praise that's due to him is given to mammon, the new job. So everyone in this room, here's a litmus test. If you want to know if you have a heart of worship, how grieved are you over idol worship? Because people of God instantly are grieved when they see that. Paul therefore reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers. And in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Kind of reminds me of Twitter and Facebook. Video blogs on YouTube. But then in the midst of this, Paul stands in the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life to all. Everything that breathes, all things, he gives life to all. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed time and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, move, and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. That is powerful. More than we comprehend in this moment right now. I promise you that. God does not need anything from your hands. Praise is your privilege. Praise is your honor. Praise. You think God is tripping because you don't worship him? No. You think God's sitting up in heaven like, man, they just never respond. I'm always pouring out my love. I guess I'll try better next time and give Jared a better song to sing. Maybe that'll get them riled up. Trust me, he who sits in heaven doesn't need our praise nor our worship. We need to praise and worship. If we don't praise and worship, we will die. And you will be the group that hears on that last day, not well done. But depart from me. You worker of iniquity, I never knew you. And he's saying that to enthusiastic, radical, charismatic Christians who drive out devils in his name, who prophesy in his name and do many signs and wonder in his name. But yet because they were iniquitous, because they didn't know the Lord, they hear, depart from me. So I used to wrestle with that. Who's wrestled with Matthew 7? It drives me even to this day kind of like loco, like, but you are praying and prophesying and casting out demons. Like you're radical. How could you not know the Lord? How does that even work? But then one element that the Lord showed me, and I'm sure it's much more complex than I can understand for sure, but is that iniquity, lawlessness in some translations, when the law of God is to love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second law is love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus said the entire law is summed up in these two commands. 
So when God, if you look again in Acts 17, we left off at 28 and verse 29, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these things of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands, commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he is appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he's ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so people who don't worship and praise God are lawless. The law of the kingdom is praise him. Let everything that have breath praise him. It's not a suggestion. It's not uh, something you should do to have your, you know, have a little bit better morning or better day. That is the law of the kingdom. Praise God. Whether you like him or hate him, that's why the scripture says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Everything will sing the song. Praise is an option, but it is mandatory at the same time. You either choose life by praising, worshiping, or you die. But you still will praise on your way to hell. Demons in hell are going to worship God. And I said this many times before, but if you have this comprehension that the devil is like the king of hell, no, 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 no. The devil is in hell or the lake of fire, and he's not in control of anything. Those demons are in chains. They're not, they're not in power. So everything will praise and worship him. Anybody in here like now and later, Candy? You can praise now, you can praise later, <laughs> but you will praise. And so in the meantime, while we have this opportunity, while there is still breath, in these lungs while our blood is still running warm in our veins. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And you'll find your purpose and you'll understand the heart of Jesus. Amen.